Breaking the News with Des Clark. I am Des Clark and this is Breaking the News, the show that breaks the week's news and asks four opinionated panellists to put it back together again. And this week I'm joined by Scottish comedy legend Fred McCauley and with him is comedian Tiff Stevenson and facing them is stand-up Mark Nelson and joining him is comic Elaine Malcolmson. In the news this week, it might be more than 18 months to wait but the nation is set to be treated with an extra day off to mark the Queen reaching 70 years on the throne. Just the news that everybody needs in these difficult times. A chance to spend another day at home. <laughs> <laughs> Senior UK government figures have been made to surrender their phones as part of an inquiry into the leaking of information. When investigators had difficulty accessing Jacob Rees-Mogg's phone, he explained, It's easy. One simply turns the handle on the side before asking an operator to connect you. <laughs> <laughs> and Ken Spears, the co-creator of the cartoon series Scooby-Doo, has sadly died at the age of 82. As a tribute to the show he helped to create, his funeral is due to be held at an abandoned theme park. <laughs> <laughs> right, you've met the panel, let's crack on with round one. This is the Broken News Round, where the teams have to guess two major stories of the week that have been mashed together into one single news headline. So, Fred and Tiff, can you tell me our first story, please? Pfizer say they have a president-elect, which is 90% effective against Donald Trump. But how are you feeling about it? Not to get too excited, Joe Biden needs to be stored at minus 80 degrees. Mr Biden said it's an embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, lots to get through there, Tiff. Can you maybe select what our first story might be? Obviously, this story is about the fact that uh, Pfizer... Have a, have a vaccine which we've bought stocks of and it's apparently 90% effective, which is weird because, like, lots of anti-vax guys don't mind a 90% effective drug when it's a woman taking it not to get pregnant. <laughs> 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 uh, the developers Pfizer and BioNTech described it as a great day for science and humanity. The vaccine has been tested on 43,500 people in six countries and no safety concerns have been raised. The vaccine needs to be kept at temperatures below minus 80 degrees Celsius, so the entire UK stock will be stored at a bus stop in Aberdeen. <laughs> Fred, it's the news we've been waiting for, a light at the end of the tunnel. What do we think about this vaccine then? Yeah, well, uh, unlike you, Des, uh, I'm not just using 90% of the consonants in the word Pfizer. <laughs> Um, <laughs> let's be honest. <laughs> I, I'm a 100% I'm a consonant guy, but uh, what I recall is that it was Pfizer that brought us Viagra. Uh, and when I say us, I mean yes. humanity, not me personally. <laughs> um, but the good news is that they're going to be offering a two-for-one deal where you can get the vaccine and <laughs> Viagra. So you get a shot in the arm and then you get a shot in the swings. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, are you celebrating this week then about the vaccine? Yes, uh, I am, although I did uh, invest all of my entire family savings in Zoom shares the other day, so uh, <laughs> that was a mistake. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, folk have asked me, like, are you going to take it? And I was like, of course I'll take it, like, because I've bought food and ate it from a burger van at Tea in the Park and survived. So I'm fairly on <laughs> I'm immune to everything now. So. <laughs> My only worry is how big the needle will have to be to maintain social distancing. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be at World Dark. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> I'm a bit worried because the government's been buying loads of them and it's not really confirmed that it's useful. And I just fear that we've learned nothing from the Sony mini disc. Just spend loads of money on the. Spend loads of money on the next new thing and then you end up playing vinyl. But what if it's the same <laughs> with the vaccine and it turns out that like, dock leaves are the answer or something? <laughs> <laughs> Might have been there all along. Uh, Mark, what about you? Maybe unrealistic in thinking this or maybe hopeful. Do you think we can get back to the way things used to be? I'm very, very hopeful, yeah. I'm very uh, positive. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that next year we're back to normal and I can start that Danish mink farm that I've always dreamed of running. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what about obviously within this 2020 it's coming towards the end in the next month or so a lot of lessons in it Tiff 
What has 2020 taught you? Oh, a big lesson. Um, you know, the first few Zoom meetings I had uh, in my living room and I was late for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, my fiance sort of expressed disbelief that I could be late for something in my own house. So I had to reiterate that tardiness is is a state of mind. It's not a destination. Oh, beautiful! <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a lesson and probably a country music song in there. Tiff. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Fred? Maybe the vaccine draws us to a close in this chapter, but obviously it's a year we'll never forget. What has twenty twenty taught you, Fred? A, a few things, Des. It's taught me that I can. Enjoy Endure. Mm -hmm. It's taught me that I can adapt. It's taught me that I'm compliant. Uh, you have to remember that just three weeks ago, I was a ballet dancer called Fatima. <laughs> 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 Uh, a lot of lessons from this year. Elaine Malcolmson, what about you? Has 2020 taught you anything? I don't want to make it all about me, but back in July, um, I blew all the seeds off a dandelion and a wonner, right? <laughs> and that's three wishes, right? Yes. We've got a Biden win, a vaccine, right? Let's just wait and see if I get new slippers for Christmas. <laughs> 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 the COVID-19 vaccine is the right answer Well done Fred and Tiff You get two points for that Now to you, Mark and Elaine What was the other story we were after? Joe Biden has been named the president-elect uh, And everyone in the entire world has accepted this Apart from the current president, which is <laughs> very, is going to is become going to become very very problematic. Like I'm, I'm a huge fan of uh, the U.S. Civil War, and I can't actually believe I'm going to get to live through one. It should be good. <laughs> um, it is the news that Joe Biden was elected the 46th president of the United States after pulling ahead and beating Donald Trump. Mr. Trump is only the third elected president since the Second World War to lose re-election and is yet to concede. The Trump campaign has said it's taken legal action against the decision, but has yet to provide any credible evidence of voter fraud. Uh, Joe Biden delivered a speech in his hometown of Wilmington saying, I don't see red states or blue states, which is a nice sentiment, but not a very reassuring start to have a 77-year-old man listing all the things that he can't see. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are, and Mark, the question is, do you think it's settled? Will Trump just let it go and concede? No, he won't. Because um, he's, he's kind of like, you know that drunk guy you get in like bowling clubs that won't get off the puggy and keeps yelling that the buttons are broken. Yeah. That's what Trump is <laughs> just now. And I think what's really annoyed me is, because I, I stayed up the whole of the night of the elections expecting a result, mm. and you're kind of going, why is it taking Pennsylvania? <laughs> They've still not finished Pennsylvania. <laughs> like, the, the Orkney Islands managed to count all their <laughs> votes, and most of them are delivered by Puffin. Like, what's happening <laughs> in Pennsylvania? <laughs> like... But it's nice, it's nice having Biden now that it's really soothing mm. all of a sudden. Do you know, it's like you've been force-fed raw onions for four years and finally <laughs> found a renning. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the hope. Uh, I mean, here we are, Fred. Usually in the past, convention would be that the opponent would concede at this stage when a candidate passes 270. Donald Trump is challenging it. That continues. Do you think this will be settled anytime soon? I'd be loath to, to slag off the American democratic process uh, because when it comes to snappy decisions, here we are still mm -hmm. looking at Brexit four and a half years after that. I mean, there are kids who were at primary school when the Brexit vote took place that are growing moustaches for Movember. <laughs> 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 uh, Tiff, what about it? I'm, I'm sure you've been following it. Do we think this is settled now? No. <laughs> um, but Scottish people have been quoting Bart Simpson on overthrowing governments for years now. Don't have a coup, man. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, applause, please. <laughs> yes. Come on. Uh, well researched, Tiff. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, Fred, what about this? This transition of power, what do you see happening for Trump in the next two months? Very little change from what he's been doing the preceding 46 months. <laughs> he'll be tweeting, he'll be watching Fox TV and he'll be playing golf. And, Des, I've got to say that the current uh, president of the United States tweeting on his mobile phone about the results of the election from the golf course, well... 
the man has got nothing left for me. That is just the biggest offence in his four years. Um, <laughs> I tell you this, if you took your mobile phone out in my golf club, you'd get a letter from the secretary, and there is nothing worse than that. <laughs> uh, Tiff, what about yourself? Donald Trump has two months left. What's he going to do in the next two months? Apparently, Trump is talking about moving to Scotland. Just imagining all the get to signs uh, <laughs> which would be there to greet him. It's like, listen, you can buy chunks of land anywhere. You cannot buy a welcome, mate. No one wants you. <laughs> um, we're, to we're talking as well, Tiff, about possibly renaming Scottish airports. It'd be some laugh if Trump loses the election, then has to land at Janie Godley International. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, maybe he'll end up going to uh, Four Seasons Total Landscaping. <laughs> uh, just to explain that story, it was the uh, Trump fight back and his legal team to make the statement on why the uh, the votes were illegal. They wanted to book the Four Seasons. They meant the big hotel, and someone got it wrong, and they booked, as Tiff says, the Four <laughs> Seasons total landscaping, uh, a car park and a garden centre. Everything is happening in car parks. Oh, it's a big time for car parks. <laughs> it's like comedy, yep. driving films... Biden did his acceptance speech in a car park. Giuliani did lose his mind in a car park. Joni Mitchell might want to reconsider being such a Debbie Downer in parking lots. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I love that. At Joe Biden's inauguration, he'll be sworn in using a Bible, which might surprise Biden, uh, is that since he was first elected senator, they've added a New Testament. So there's something to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well done. Well done, Mark and Elaine. You get two points for that. It was the mashup of a COVID vaccine and the US election result. And at the end of that round, the teams are on two points apiece. <laughs> now, so much of our news is about public opinion. And this week, we spoke to friends of the show, Judy Murray and comedian Scott Agnew. So, Mark and Elaine, what story do you think Scott is on about here? I would choose hibernation or monastic because living on my own, I've spent a lot of the time in silence, seeing nobody. Willie Rennie has got a terrible habit of saying the data as data, data. <laughs> if you know Scott, that could just be a random voice note. Um, they're talking about the, the word of the year mm. that the Collins Dictionary have announced. They do this every single year and approach to Christmas. And what's been the most popular and most useful word of the year so far, and it is... Uh, it's lockdown. It is. Maybe should be no surprise. What do you think, Mark? Have they chosen the right word? Yeah, I don't think it could have been anything else. I mean, and, and, and they've got like a kind of top ten, and they're all like coronavirus, social distancing, all of that kind of stuff. There's a, there's a couple of weird ones. Um, there is uh, the word mukbang, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> is a... Apparently it's a video where the host eats a huge quantity of food for amusement. <laughs> which is pretty much going to be every Zoom call at Christmas dinner this year. And, uh, <laughs> and one of the other ones, right down the bottom, was a TikToker, or as it was previously known, a clock. <laughs> <laughs> Elaine, lockdown is the word of the year. Do you think they made the right call on that? It's a good list, isn't it? We've learned a lot of new words this year, that coronavirus, social distancing, self-isolate fellow. We've learned new words, we've learned how to wash our hands properly. Mm -hmm. We've learned how counting works. Mm -hmm. It's like 2020's <laughs> been one long episode yeah. of Sesame Street. <laughs> <laughs> I, for one, hope that Bert and Ernie's relationship has not suffered under the strain of lockdown and the intensity <laughs> of their social bubble. I love that. Uh, <laughs> Tiff, what about yourself? Lockdown got the nod as the number one. Do you think that was the right one? Um, well, I'm enjoying this glossary of the apocalypse, which is sort of what it feels like. Right? Um, also, I, I was surprised that, like, BLM, uh, Black Lives Matter, had made the dictionary, like, in 2020, even though it first became a movement in 2013, which sort of fits in with how long it takes most white people to catch up to black culture and history, I suppose. Um, <laughs> Mark, what about you? Any words you think are missing from this list? Cummings which is to show a complete <laughs> disregard for anyone else on the planet. Um, also, also known as a ferrier. <laughs> <laughs> Do a panel of a favourite word. There's a question for you. Uh, we've talked about words in the past days, and you might recall my favourite word is encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. You might be wondering about the origin of the word encyclopedia, and like many of our words, it comes either from Latin or Greek. 
and this one comes from two Greek words, uh, in keklo, which means all round, and pedia, which means to the creepy bloke's house. <laughs> 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 do you have a favourite word, Tiff? I do like the word Herbert. Oh. Which sometimes Cockneys say, like, what a Herbert. <laughs> Tiff, it feels like every time that you're on the show, we end up some way wandering into the world of Danny Dyer. <laughs> I used to do like an impression of Danny Dyer on a on yeah. a show on a Radio 4 show where I would just make stuff up like let the monkey sniff the biscuit. <laughs> and see if people would go, <laughs> that's not a saying. <laughs> and also, can we just say, if you let a, a monkey sniff a biscuit, you might start another pandemic, so please be careful. <laughs> <laughs> been caught by this before. Right, to you again, Fred and Tiff. What do you think Judy Murray is talking about here? I'm all for a quicker journey time, of course, but it's far too fast for a granny like me. It would be a claustrophobic nightmare. Give me the Edinburgh trams any day. It's the Virgin Hyperloop. And it is the news that the Virgin Hyperloop has trialled its first ever journey with passengers in the desert of Nevada. This is amazing. In the trial, two passengers travelled the length of a 500-metre test track in 15 seconds, reaching 107 miles an hour. I have to say, though, when I was 17, Virgin Hyperloop was the nickname of the streets that the girls at my school used to avoid walking past my house. So it's nice to hear it <laughs> used in another context. Uh, Fred, what about you? Would you be willing to go on the Virgin Hyperloop? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Although uh, I thought Judy was talking about the Glasgow subway, so I've got 10 minutes of material about that, Des. Um, <laughs> you could get from Glasgow to Edinburgh in 12 minutes, Des. Oh. Or two hours if you include the replacement bus service from Croy to Lenzi. <laughs> Mark, what about you? Innovation and travel here. Would you ever go in the Virgin Hyperloop? I don't think I would, to be honest. No. Um, I don't think I could trust a Virgin to magnetically levitate me when they can't even get the Wi-Fi working on their trains. So I'm not going <laughs> to be hugely optimistic about that. Elaine, what about yourself? Some people say an exciting discovery is going to change travel, but would you have a go on the Virgin Hyperloop? Well, it says you'll be able to get from Gatwick to Heathrow in four minutes. Or you could just go to the right airport in the first place. <laughs> 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 that would definitely help, yeah. But what do we think about the idea of investing in transport? It seems to be something all the prominent billionaires are doing at the moment. Yes, I'd forgotten Elon Musk, my least favourite fragrance. Uh, he's he's also <laughs> he's also tried this sort of back in uh, 2013, I think. And what we need to take something from this: the billionaires are trying to get off Earth, like they know something bad is <laughs> yeah. sort of going down. Well, here's a question: obviously, the billionaires can do it, but if you could invent a new mode of transport, what would it be? Fred, I'm going to come to you first here. If I was inventing it, I would invent something that could hover just one foot higher than Donald Trump's wall. Brilliant. <laughs> oh, that would annoy him, wouldn't it? <laughs> that would annoy him more than a black woman in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> Elaine, what about you? If you could invest and invent a new mode of transport, what would it be? What sort of a question is that anyway? Mm. Invent a new mode of transport. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think I'm MacGyver or something? I think they've done all the <laughs> successful ones already. The ones that, I don't know, I'm a monorail crossed with a horse. <laughs> <laughs> See, you can do this. <laughs> well done. Hyperloop, the transport of the future is the correct answer. Two points go to Fred and Tiff. You're tuned to a socially distant breaking the news on BBC Radio Scotland with me, Des Clark. Now, this round is all about who's in the news. I'll play you a clip of a mystery person. All you have to do is tell me who it is. So, Fred and Tiff, you're up first this time. Who is this? I hate people who patronise. I dislike snobbishness. I don't like selfishness. I find those intolerable ways to behave. 
That was uh, John Major. It yeah. is Sir John Major, correct answer, Fred, who was in the news this week after a speech he made in London. The Conservative former Prime Minister lambasted the controversial move by Boris Johnson to override key elements of the Brexit deal. Now, Major yeah. also spoke about the prospect of a second referendum in Scottish independence, saying the UK yeah. government could find it difficult to stave off demands for another referendum in Scotland and should consider a two-stage process where a vote on the principle of independence was followed by another on the terms of separation of... Offered. So there we go. Fred, what do you think about that? Wow, I thought it was, it was amazing, you know, and, and when Major was Prime Minister, he had a sense that he knew what he was doing, you know, we weren't concern, concerned about whether his Chief of Staff had fallen out with his Director of Policy about what the Director of <laughs> Communications had done wrong. <laughs> it, it was the Prime Minister that was kind of doing things. And, you know, I, I, he's reflecting on Brexit and just uh, and, and mirroring, uh, an effect, in effect, a, a Scottish independence referendum, uh, and he's weighed in, suggesting that the referendum should be held as you say, Des, on the principle first and foremost, mm -hmm. and then on the actual terms of separation. And I, I, I think that sounds OK, you know. A lot will depend on next year's Scottish election, of course, and what the First Minister, Douglas Ross, then thinks that we should do. I thought we could all do with a laugh. So there we go, Tiff. Did we ever think that John Major would be the voice of reason? Well, no, because we always refer to John Major as the voice of monotony. And, in fact, uh, even on Spit and Image, he was always depicted as the grey man, wasn't he? Yeah. He was the grey man. It, he, you know, the speech he gave was it was smart, it had gravitas, which is sort of stark contrast to our current leader, which, you know, like watching Boris do a speech is like watching a six-year-old punch their way through a word trifle. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> But uh, yeah, in terms of he wants he wants two votes, doesn't he? He wants one uh, on on the indie ref itself, and then another on the terms of separation, which is very Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> He's gone all unconscious coupling on it. So um... I think um, I think it's a good idea the the two the two votes for the thing because they could combine it with a vaccine because you need to get that twice, <laughs> so you can double it up <laughs> and save. <laughs> Saving the appointments, you just vote while you're there and then go back for your second dose and do your second vote. So. Uh, Elaine, final thoughts on this to you. If you could bring back anybody from frontline politics to solve today's problems, who would it be and why? What do we need? We need someone bold with real ambition. I don't know if there are any politicians <laughs> like that. So maybe Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> <laughs> he had... Real ambition, didn't he? Because mm. it wasn't just infinity, was it? It was infinity and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> Even if he only made it halfway to infinity, that'd be, that'd be something, wouldn't it? The only thing most of us have in common with John Major is that at some point, we've all fancied a curry after a few pints. <laughs> 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 yeah, well done. Two points, Fred and Tiff. That was Sir John Major. Right to you, Mark and Elaine. It's your turn now. Who is this and why are they in the news? I've got the biggest Planet of the Apes collection in the UK. Uh, the toys, the figures. I've got the original wagon. <laughs> They threw Charlton Heston into in the 1968 <laughs> film. That incredibly <laughs> lucky and interesting Planet of the Apes fan is uh, <laughs> Shane Ritchie. Yeah, it is Shane Ritchie. Why are we talking Shane Ritchie this week, Mark? He's going into I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. So he's going into the castle, the Welsh castle that it's been relocated to. Have you seen the lineup for I'm a Celebrity? Are you excited by it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I stopped, I stopped kind of watching it a couple of years ago. I might watch it again now that there's just to see how they do the bush tucker trials differently because they won't have the exotic animals or the mm. dangerous heights and stuff like that. So be, the bush tucker trials will essentially be staying in a tent with midges and then eating a ginster's pasty at some point. <laughs> 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 Elena, are you excited for this year's I'm a Celebrity? No. OK. Unless... <laughs> in, unless in the spirit of everyone coming together during these difficult times... The Bush Tucker trials became clinical trials. <laughs> <laughs> then I might watch. <laughs> Fred, what about this? Uh, this year's I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. The lineup is released. Does it excite you? Is it a yep. show that you watch? I, I dip in and out of it, I'll be honest. Uh, the interesting thing for me is the difference in what the people are going to get paid. Uh, I read that Vernon Kay is going to get £250,000, Russell Watson, 100000 uh, Jessica Plummer, she's getting 100000 which is not as much as my plumber earns. And it doesn't say... 
<laughs> it doesn't say how much Mo Farah is getting, uh, and I gather that Shane Ritchie is just doing it for the crack. <laughs> <laughs> and can you can you let the lawyer know if that's spelled C R A I C, please? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll be in touch. Uh, I have to say, Fred's talking about the money involved this year for the celebs. Vernon K has said that he's not doing I'm a celebrity to get me here for the money or to boost his flagging career. Vernon says that, but our survey says. <laughs> there you go, Vernon. Sorry, mate. <laughs> People have spoken. If we're obviously talking Shane Ritchie here and some of the other names announced. This year's I'm a Celebrity lineup is out there. Are you excited by it? I think the challenges will be interesting. I think they'll probably do one with place names and one of the challenges will be finding a vowel. Um... <laughs> <laughs> um... Des, can I can I quickly tell you a wee anecdote? So uh, back, the first one I think was in 2002 and I'd been doing a fair bit of television at the time. And my agent got in touch with me and said, oh, there's this thing has come through. They're doing a new programme out in Australia called I'm a Celebrity, get me out of here. Don't touch it with a barge pole, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> Just think, Fred, if you went in there, you could have married Peter Andre. <laughs> 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 How much you've missed out <laughs> Well done, Shane Ritchie is the right answer. Two points go to Mark and Elaine. And it's time now for our final quickfire round, which is all about deciphering the numbers in the news. I will read out a headline. All the teams have to do is fill in the blanks. So get ready, teams. When we run out of time, you'll hear this. Scooby-Doo, where are you? Right, let's go, teams. Here's our first question. 200 people in Falkirk tried to do what last week? Was it leave? <laughs> <laughs> 200 people in Falkirk tried to do what last week? Uh, was it get on the Falkirk wheel thinking it was the Hyperloop? <laughs> <laughs> 200 people in Falkirk tried to do what last week? Understand exactly which tiers are in just now. <laughs> <laughs> 200 people in Falkirk tried to do what last week? Claim victory in the US presidential election. <laughs> 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 the great state of Falkirk, they're still counting. It's going to be so good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can give you the right answer. It is that 200 people in Falkirk tried to hold an illegal rave in a barn. Scooby Doo, where are you? And that is it. It's over. That's the klaxon. John has beat it. It means at the end of the quiz, our winners this week are Fred McCauley and Tiff Stevenson. <laughs> And commiserations to Mark Nelson and Elaine Malcolmson. And we'll leave Woo. you with the breaking the news, breaking news, just in. Police were sent to a derelict farm on Saturday night in Falkirk where a man was charged in connection with organising an illegal rave. Police confiscated large quantities of E but were unfamiliar with another drug found at the farm labelled E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> <laughs> a Norwegian study has found that 54 is the age at which a person's get up and go runs out. Many over 54s were greatly angered by the claim, but couldn't he really muster the energy to do anything about it? <laughs> <laughs> and discussions have taken place about the four nations of the UK taking a joint approach to dealing with Christmas. After a virtual meeting involving the collective First Ministers and Michael Gove, Nicola Sturgeon revealed she was delighted with the outcome, having drawn whales in the secret Santa. <laughs> <laughs> the news is broken. I've been Des Clark. Goodbye! Woo!